Hello and welcome to this Bloomberg Quint video on Brexit. And a Brexit it is. Not only have the Britons decided to actually exit the EU, but we've also just heard from David Cameron, the British Prime Minister, and he will be stepping down in October. To discuss the short-term, medium-term and long-term implications of this, I have with me top London lawyer Peter King. Thanks so much for joining us, Mr. King. I'd like to start by asking you, originally we thought that this would really kick in Article 50. What's the whole deal with Article 50 now, after we've heard from the Prime Minister? Article 50 is the uh, provision of the treaty which allows a country to exit from the European Union um, and it provides for a two-year timetable for that exit. Most people think that two years would be too short from the UK's point of view and one of the questions has always been following a referendum, will the, will the Article 50 notice be given immediately or after a period of time and during that period of time maybe some more negotiations will take place. What the Prime Minister has said so far is that that won't be a decision for him, that will be a decision for his successor. So we won't know about the Article 50 notice until October at the earliest. And most probably, uh, and most people agree on this, the process will take not just two years but probably three to five years at least before um, the process of exit is complete. So we're looking at a very long period of uncertainty. Right, Mr. King. Also in terms of the divorce proceedings, really, because eventually Britain will be exiting the EU. Uh, I'd like to ask you a couple of things. When do these proceedings start? So the, the formal start of them is with this uh, notice that's given under Article 50. Informally, however, they start next week because the Prime Minister is going to the European Council meeting and at that point, he will be starting to talk to the EU partners about how the divorce might work. And of course, we have no experience of this. The only country ever to have left the EU is Greenland. And Greenland has a population which is um, about, um, about one, less than one-tenth of that of the UK. Um, so a completely different situation. Um, and there is an, an enormous amount of work to do to negotiate the terms of the exit. Absolutely, Mr. King. And I'd imagine that, you know, they'd be in, in quite, a, in quite a, a stressful situation there because not, they have to do more than a couple of things. Not only do they have to really traverse the path with Brussels, they also need to look at, you know, trade deals with other countries from around the world. And, um, and at the same time, uh, figure out what regulations would apply even domestically in England and in the city of London as well. Yes, so there's, a, there's an enormous task here. So we're looking at the divorce proceedings with the EU, as you call them. We're looking at the negotiation of new trade deals with the rest of the world. And so for the last 40 years, the UK has relied upon trade deals negotiated at the European Union level. So there's very little expertise within the UK on negotiating that sort of trade deal. Um, that's it. That's the first. Those are the first two areas. And then the third area is regulation. A significant part of our regulation of industries like financial services, pharmaceuticals, food and so on comes from the EU. And large parts of our corporate and securities law come from the EU as well. Um, so what Britain has to do is to find ways of, of, of uh, replicating that regulation, those laws within our domestic law uh, so that there's um, still a possibility for business to operate in an orderly way. Right, Mr. King, and I'd also like to ask you, in the interim period, whilst these negotiations and renegotiations are actually taking place, uh, would EU law continue to apply to England or would it be, a, you know, a sort of a chaotic situation? No, you're absolutely right. EU law would continue to apply. And um, during this interim period, we're still a member of the EU. So all the rules that apply at the moment continue to apply to us. Um, and how they will apply and whether there will be any sort of interim changes is a matter for the European Union to decide. And of course, we're still part of that decision at the moment. When it comes to impact on business and also in terms of how countries like India will be viewed and how they'll be viewing this as well, what are your thoughts? Well, uh, this is a very big topic. So, one of the key areas for, in relation to business is to look at, for each business, what are your connections with the EU? For example, um, uh, some large Indian businesses have chosen to invest very heavily in the EU 
and some of them have invested through the UK. Um, the automotive industry is a very good example where you know, a lot of cars are built in the UK by foreign, by non-EU manufacturers. And the UK has been used as a base by those manufacturers to sell cars to the rest of the European Union. Um, that may or may not make sense after the exit takes place. Um, so businesses around the world are going to be considering their investment in the UK and their investment in the U EU and where their new money should go. Should it go into the UK? Should it go into a, another EU country, which gives the benefit of the single market? So there, there's some examples of how businesses will be looking at things. Here's another one. Um, at the moment, there's free mobility of employees within the EU. So if I am a, a US business and I'm working within the EU and I choose to employ a British person to do something important, and I then want to base that British person in Frankfurt instead of in London, I can do that freely at the moment without needing visas or work permits or anything like that. That will not be the case once the EU has once the UK has left the EU. Um, so businesses will need to start planning for that sort of lack of employee mobility. And of course, it depends on the business. For some businesses, these issues won't be important. But for a lot of businesses investing in the EU, particularly in areas like manufacturing, uh, these issues will be very, very significant. And look, coming back to India, um, Indian businesses have been looking for the past 20 years at least to expand significantly outside uh, India and the UK is an obvious place for in Indian businesses to come because we have a number of cultural affinities with India. Uh, whether that will make sense in the future is another question because the UK will no longer be able to operate as the gateway to the European market in the way that it has in the past. Right, Mr. King, I think as a very quick follow-up question, you did mention immigration as well and that was one of the key issues surrounding this whole Brexit campaign. Considering you know, after the exit, there'll be a lot of uh, you know, restrictions and barriers on obviously free movement. Would this also mean that the UK could possibly, the new government could possibly, possibly be looking at reconsidering, uh, you know, immigration policies for other countries like India and other emerging markets? I, I think the, the new government will have an awful lot on its plate to consider how it wants to deal with free movement of people within the European Union. So I don't foresee a significant change in immigration policy for other countries. Thank you so much for joining us on Bloomberg Quint. Thank you very much.